This is a going back, remembering UGA interview with General Eugene Phillips, conducted by Fran Lane on May 20th, 2008. Today we're at General Phillips' home in Royston, Georgia. Thank you so much for allowing us to come and visit today. It's a pleasure indeed to have you all here, and I'm flattered that you were interested in oh, me. We, what an interesting, uh, full life you are, you've led and you're leading. Uh, but let's start in the beginning. You grew up in this area, didn't you? Uh, yes. My family has been in G Franklin County in northeast Georgia since 1799. And one great, great, great grandfather arrived uh, uh, in 1792. So we have been here a long time. I was born in Cannon, went, attended school in Tacoa and Sandy Cross Community Elementary School and Royston before going to the university. So uh, local schools, what were some of the earlier influences on your life, General Phillips? My parents, of course, my mother had been a teacher in her youth and she inspired me to make the most of my opportunities uh, in the classroom. And uh, my father, of course, uh, urged me to do my best and always do my duty, which I have followed all of my life. I remember you said your mother had been to the state normal school, but you were the first person who attended college. Is that correct? Uh, yes, she okay. was. Um, this would have been during the years of the Depression. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about how you conjured up uh, that that pile of resources that allowed you to attend the University of Georgia. What? I wanted to eventually to get off the farm. It was hard, back-breaking labor. <clears throat> and uh, I thought it was a better, a better life and that I should uh, study uh, and try to improve myself and do the best I could uh, with uh, what talents I could develop. But it, it, it was difficult because uh, it, it was a very lean economy in those days. And, Nothing compared to the opportunities that our young people have today. No hope scholarship then, no, of course. No scholarships. Very, very limited opportunity. So you worked your way through school? Or? Yes. Uh, at, at the university, I'm under the auspices of the National Youth Administration, one of the federal programs, I was able to, to get it, earn $12 a month uh, at 25 cents an hour, and that would feed me uh, most of the month. But I needed three more dollars in order to eat every day, so I didn't eat uh, every day. My grandchildren couldn't understand that. I'm sure they couldn't. I told them I was hungry all the time. Oh, my. Well, you, yeah. um, so you worked, and you studied hard. What did you, the campus look like when you arrived in the 1930s? It's been almost three quarters of a century since my first visit to the university to uh, uh, check out the requirements, <coughs> pick up a catalog. We went to see Ms. Bondurant. Miss Bertie Bondurant? Bondurant, yeah. Uh -huh. She uh, was the personnel officer, a very gracious lady. She welcomed us. And the campus was, at that time, not quite as well groomed as it is today, but it, it looked spacious to us. And uh, my f friend, uh, Walton Harper, and I who, uh, graduated uh, from Royston in May of 35, and we went to college together and were roommates all four years. He was in the military also. But we arrived in front of uh, the administration building and the uh, soaring columns of the two old buildings joined together. And uh, we, we learned about uh, architecture of the Corinthian columns right. on the Capitol and uh, the, the massive uh, Doric columns up on the, the chapel. At the time we were there, the uh, tomb's oak was still there. And we were impressed with it. We wondered what he must have said <laughs> that day when most of the people in the chapel went out to hear him rather than the, the scheduled speaker.
but it, it was a, to us a, a beautiful place, inspiring, compared to our bare campus at Royston had a two-story uh, high school building, which included the elementary grades, not a sprig of grass on the grounds, anything like that. And adjacent to us was a weed-filled patch 90 yards long on which we played football. And uh, when we got up to the 10-yard line, we had to move back another 10 <laughs> yards so we could have 100. To get you 100 yards in. Yeah. And, and I played uh, I played football uh, high school not very well. And uh, uh, I have a picture of our team. I think the heaviest one on the team weighed about 150, and I weighed <laughs> about 115 pounds. But we, we, we did have fun, and we learned about good sportsmanship. But it would, I couldn't even have qualified to be water boy for the Bulldogs, but I went to see them at practice. We had uh, pretty good ball teams in the 30s, didn't uh, we? Yes, we, uh, as I remember my freshman year, we had a pretty good team. We, we lost to, uh, we beat, actually beat Florida, I believe, that year, and, but lost to Tech. And in those days after the Georgia Tech game, whether it was played in Atlanta or Athens, there was a lot of rowdyism and people trying to tear down the goalposts. And I think the legislature finally grew tired of paying the bill for all of this and they put a stop to it. I didn't participate in that because I figured that if you lose, you lose. I had no desire to tear down the goalposts. Some of that hadn't changed is the scary well, part. So. One thing in those days, we all received a, a student ID card, and with that card, you could go to the ball games. My grandson, who graduated a year ago this month, saw one football game because he had to participate in the lottery. It seems to me that the students should be permitted to attend the games. Let some of the other people watch it on television. Uh, but uh, we, we went to the ball games, and uh, <coughs> the military department hired us boys uh, to park cars, so that was a chance to earn another couple of dollars. What, Sanford Stadium certainly didn't look the way it looks now. It was very small compared to, it, it was not so vast as it is now. What, was it? It was dedicated in 29. 29. Does that sound right? So by the time you yeah. got there, it was... Yeah. It had seen some years of use. Yes, it had. And some of the benches needed replacing. Right, right. And since then, I think we've had yeah. at least four or five expansions. Right. But we, we never missed a game. And we Good dog fans. That's, that's what we like. That's what we like. You were a journalism major. Yes. <clears throat> when did you have feel this interest in writing? Is that something that you had well, had during... Writing always came easy for me, and spelling, I could usually won the spelling bees. Uh, and I had written a school column for the Royston Record. And on occasion, I would farm out my talents to classmates when we had a requirement for a theme. <laughs> uh, and I remember on one occasion, where there were 30 members of the class. I wrote every one in the class and I still had the best, <laughs> 15 cents a copy. Well, that was big money. That's big money in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the 30s. <laughs> so I had some practice in writing. <laughs> and so you knew from the beginning that's what yeah. you wanted to do. Oh, right? yeah. And was Dean Drury the individual who was heading up the journalism school? Yes, that yeah. Uh, Dean Drury, oh, fabulous character, a gentleman of the old school inspiring man. I loved him. I thought he was a wonderful professor. <clears throat> I wonder he didn't flunk me. Uh, we had a skit on Sigma Delta Chi once and I was had to play him and, and he used to sit at his desk and, and he always turned the pigeon toe and turned his feet in like that. So I did that and he told us a story uh, <coughs> about uh, uh, Mencken, H.L. Mencken, who once wrote a <coughs> magazine article, The Sahara of the beaux Art. and that's a French word meaning the beautiful arts. 
he said. So he, he, the dean did not get mad at us, but I, I don't think he was pleased with my performance. But he, he didn't hold it against me, and finally I was able to graduate. And on occasion, he would lend me a book. He didn't do that very often. He had this, do you remember, his, his walls were lined with books. He, he wrote reviews, and he, he steered me in the right direction. And I, I enjoyed every day in the journalism school. He knew he had a good one. Yes. He knew he had a good one when he had you, yeah. I guess. Your yeah. son suggested that I ask you about a casket ad that you wrote for an advertising class. Does that ring a bell? Mm, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm trying to see how, how the little couplet went. Oh, Krauss and Jewelry Casket. Ask the man who's in one. <laughs> a tisket, a tasket. Krauss and Jewelry Casket. Ask the man who's in one. So like the old Packard, remember the Packard Motor Company? Ask so the man who drives one. You, um, so you did well in your advertising class then. You were yeah. in a public relations major, is that right? Oh. No, I was. Uh, <coughs> I don't think we had a PR major as such at that time, uh, but most of journalism graduates drifted in through their connection with newspapers, and I was in the news sequence and uh, was able to sell an article time to time. My senior year at Georgia, I was the campus correspondent for the Atlanta Journal. Fred Moon was a city editor. I don't know whether you ever met him. He's an old timer. Uh, and that was another $25 a month. So I was you were making be big beginning to get into year. tall cotton. Yeah. Com Comparatively speaking. Really. But what, were there other faculty mem members that were memorable or had influence oh, yeah. on you? <coughs> we had a gentleman uh, who, who really loved drama. He, Ed Krauss was his name. He. Uh, uh, he was from Wisconsin, always well dressed, immaculate, and, and uh, always in a hurry. Uh, and <coughs> I didn't have any any of his classes, maybe maybe one. But Dean Drury had, at that time had a, a twelve thirty class, and he used to love to torment us. Some of us had not had breakfast. And he insisted on talking about what he'd had the night before, roast beef and gravy, he would say, and we say. <laughs> Stomach's was, rumbling and drilling, huh? It was very un, unfair, we thought. Did you ever uh, have an opportunity to get to know Dean Tate? Dean I, kn Tate? I knew him well. I was uh, I was very fond of him. I thought he was a fair man. Some of the students uh, didn't like him because they thought he was a little too severe in doling out uh, uh, demerits. But uh, many years later, I went back to the campus on a visit from somewhere, uh, whether the Washington or the West Coast, uh, and I bumped into him in front of the administration building. He remembered my name. I thought that was amazing, absolutely amazing. It was amazing, and, and he also, I think, is known for somebody who not only remembers your yeah. name, but can they ask you about your family. Yes. Oh. And I had an opportunity <coughs> over the years to hear him speak at alumni meetings, and it was always delightful to see him. T tell me a little bit again about you lived, where you lived when you were in school. The first year, I mentioned to you earlier, uh, Camp Wilkins mm -hmm. had started out. It was too far away to walk in the rain. <coughs> we we found a place as a lady uh, had a boating house just opposite uh, Joe Brown, mm -hmm. and uh, she fixed up a under a little shed outside. She had storage upstairs, and down in this basement was room enough for. Uh, uh, one double bed and a single bed on top of it, and a couple of chairs. And she rented that to us for very little, and we boarded uh, Miss Durham. But once, uh, when we raided her icebox, 
she decided she didn't want us around. <laughs> she ran us off. I didn't blame her. <laughs> so we had to move to uh, 169 Barber Street. Okay. That house is still there. It's next door to the Potters. Uh, and uh, we lived there until the spring. And the, and the next year we were in another boarding house in a, a building that's just, it stood where the Bob Stevens Federal Building right. is, somewhere in that neighborhood. And finally in our senior year, we lived at 320 South Lumpkin Street. And it was just across the street from uh, the entrance to behind Lecart Hall. At that time, it was Lecart Hall. So that, that covers my residence. I think you were amazing there. to be able to remember the addresses where you were. I, I always wanted to live in Old College, but you had to politic a little to get in. And it was only in the spring quarter of my senior year that I was invited to, to move in and be the fourth boy in that uh, a little suite. Right. So I stayed at 320 South Lumpkin where I had a whole room this size to myself. <clears throat> uh. We had another professor was Willett Kempton, Wisconsin. All of our assistant professors came for some reason, the University of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Very good school. <clears throat> uh, and he, uh, we thought he was uh, an impressive, a very learned man. And during the war, I bumped into him once. I think he ended up directing uh, public relations for some federal agency. And he married a Georgia girl, Grace Harrington. So I knew him well. I minored in Romance languages, so I should mention Professor Claude Chance and uh, uh, Dr. Thaxton. They uh, instilled in me a love of French literature and the language. We arranged uh, through French friends and the embassy in Washington to have him decorated by the French government. And for some reason, Professor Chance, who was old and ill at the time, he declined the honor. I was never disappointed. And uh, Louis de Roche, the French exchange student, was helpful in that regard. I should mention the French exchange students. We had uh, several outstanding young men and women who came, <clears throat> and I remember them all and kept in touch with them over the years. Uh, Louis de Roche came from Dijon, the capital of Burgundy, where the best food in the world mm -hmm. is prepared and the best wine. And uh, <clears throat> at the same time he was there, we had uh, another Frenchman, Jacques Puyatier. He's a typical Frenchman. He had thick glasses, slick back hair, <laughs> and he uh, he was a great gangster. He uh, not gangster, but he, he'd always pull in some gay. And he had he had learned how to fall flat on his face, uh, and without hurting himself or even soiling his clothes. So we going through the reception line to meet the president of the university. He flopped on the floor, but that was a hit. not only. That was not his only claim to fame. He could imitate a siren. Uh, another boy was hailed before the uh, uh, Justice of the Peace to, for speeding. And uh, the judge asked him, says, why didn't you stop? The policeman said he turned the siren on. And the boy said, oh, I thought it was that crazy Frenchman. <laughs> Was Miss yeah. Dolores Artau the international, did she, do you remember Miss Artau? She was a person who worked with international students? Yes, yes. A little short lady? Yes. Vivacious? And yes, I remember her well. She was a good friend of Rui. Uh, the Italian student at the time, we, 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 had, uh, we had two, Dr. Dr. Rossi. Uh, he was a little older than the rest of us, a uh, very learned man. Uh, he spoke French as well as Italian. But the one uh, we loved the best was uh, a young girl named Nady Rompoli. Her father had been the secretary of Mussolini's, uh, one of his uh, uh, <coughs> government bureaus. And she used to tell me, said, Mr. Phillips, you must study a little more. And 
in that class uh, uh, studying Italian was the wife of Professor Forrest Cumming. He taught our survey in physical and mathematics. Uh, and they were both later killed. I remember when they, they had a plane load of uh, dignitaries from Georgia went to Paris and read the, and on takeoff coming back, it crashed and burned. At Orleans. And, and they were both lost. So Ms. Cumming uh, and Professor Cumming were on that flight. Mm -hmm. But he's the one, uh, he, you may have heard of him, he, he had the students flipping coins uh, to get the law of probability, and they'd, they had this contest every spring. Uh, um, I should mention the German students, too. I was fortunate enough to, uh, to uh, be in touch with these students, and uh, I was practice my languages, and they, they were good friends. And over the years, I was closest to Louis de Roche. He became an expert in uh, covering the space uh, activities down at Cape Canaveral. And uh, he was assigned to Washington several d for by his French press agency. And uh, he, he died uh, in 1960. And his, his, his widow still lives in, in Washington. The, the German students were, uh, I think I can recall them, uh, uh, Herbert Sonfoff, he's a tall Teutonic heel clicking type. He decided not to go home. When, when, when the time came to go back to Germany, he knew he'd go right into the army, and uh, he decided not to do that, so he uh, married a uh, uh, the pretty daughter of a professor up at one Harvard or somewhere. He didn't go home. But uh, Hubertus, Hubertus Scheibe uh, was a, uh, another German student. And uh, the last one was uh, Peter Wecker, Wecker, he pronounced it. He was from Heilbronn. Somthorff was from Dresden, which uh, the city was absolutely destroyed. We had one German girl. Uh, she was Louisa Burma. She was from Breslau. I was in, able to, when I was on duty in Germany, I was able to locate all these people and visit with them, and they visited me in this country. So I was very close to our student. I think we had one Chinese student at that time. I didn't. No way, I didn't meet him. And one, uh, one Cuban named Manuel Colon. So that was the sum total of all of our international students? Yes. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Let's talk a little bit more about your campus extracurricular involvement. I know uh, Tom indicated you were president of Sigma Delta Chi. Yes, I was a member, president. <coughs> I was a member of uh, Scabbard and Blade was the honorary military. Mm -hmm. Organization. I was in the, the Gridiron, Blue Key. I was historian of Demosthenia and a loyal member all those years. Oh, Although I was. Rowdy I, discussions with rowdy debates with Phi Kappa folks? Or? You know, <coughs> I, I did not actually debate, but I was a kind of the. the publicity person and the historian and the backup person for who needed help on among the officers. Splendid organization. Have you been in the uh, Demosthenian building uh, yes. in recent years? They've really done well, a nice job. Yes. Mm -hmm. it, uh, I wonder what happened to this massive portrait of John B. Gordon, General Gordon. It, was a, it, it stood against the back wall. It, it was, you remember yeah. Maybe we ought to. Maybe we can check that out for you. See uh, what they've done. I'd like to see it if I could. If it's still around. General John B. Gordon. That's where our Georgia Arch was. My freshman year, uh, because of my journalistic con connections, uh, I decided to work on the Georgia Arch, and they needed somebody to sell ads, so they named me advertising manager. And the next year, business manager, and uh, my senior year, I was editor of of the publication, and I was one of the f four students who actually founded it. 
campus magazines always run afoul of the faculty it, because of the, the, the body humor that sometimes creeps in. Uh, but we had a good one. I, I presented a bound volume of the magazine to the journalism school. I hope it's in the library there. Cracker. Hmm. The Georgia yeah. Arch magazine. Georgia, uh, we named it the Art. The, <coughs> The previous magazine had been the Georgia Cracker. Was, I think a library probably has a copy of, of that. How about the Hitchhikers Association? Tell us about that one. <laughs> well, that's the way I traveled. <clears throat> and I thought if, if we had an organization uh, and an emblem, we, we had a, somewhere here, I have a, an armband. <clears throat> that anyone wearing this armband, you know he's a fine young man and he wouldn't try to rob you or anything, and you'd give him a ride. And nearly every college student at some time hitchhiked, so I thought it would be a testimonial to their character. And uh, also collect 50 cents for the armband, which you depend on. And the, uh, the Pandora, the yearbook, had a little sketch of, of me, a uh, caricature. Says he, he's off to some college uh, somewhere to establish another chapter of the Hitchhiker. Says, God only knows why. <laughs> <laughs> but I met a lot of people, including uh, uh, Russell Long, later in the Senate, who was the son of uh, his father. Uh, yeah, and I spent the night with him when I went down. He was one of our University of Louisiana members. Of the Hitchhikers Association? Hitchhikers Association. <clears throat> I used to see him when he was in the Senate in Washington and bumped into him frequently, uh, Russell, frequently on uh, airports. A good way to get to know some folks, huh? Hitchhiking yeah, and right. the association. What were the campus politics like when you were at the university? Uh, fierce. Uh, I was uh, in the campus group, not being able to afford a fraternity, assuming I could have been received by the brothers. But we uh, we cooperated on really important issues. But we, we competing for influence. Uh, and we, we we did a lot of a lot of good work in support of the school and students who needed some direction. <clears throat> what was going on in the state at the time, General Phillips? It, was this the time was was Eugene Tamage the governor of the state when you were in school? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, during that period, uh, uh, the the governor frequently came to to the university and and other politicians and through the law students uh, we uh, we were interested in, in in politics and we thought some of it needed to be cleaned up I remember one time uh, Governor Talmadge came to and visited the Sigma New House and uh, Herman was suffering from a hangover and his son and uh, he they had to hide him uh, he didn't get to see his father that trip. They made some excuse. Uh, Herman was a good friend. My son worked for Herman one summer in Washington. In fact, he has an autographed picture of Herman. I saw him when he passed early. It's interesting, he and Bob Stevens both died at age 88. And so many of my military friends uh, didn't quite make it to age 90. It's it's interesting. You and we're going to talk about Nuremberg in a while, but Bob Stevens <coughs> was at Nuremberg too. Yes, at the same time <coughs> he, was. he was there for one of the, what we call the big IMT. <coughs> we had the, the top Nazi bigwigs were tried in the International Military Tribunal. We had hundreds of reporters from around the world came to cover the proceeding, and he had been a German exchange student himself. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he was brought in for that, but he didn't stay until the bitter end because he said uh, uh, his wife Grace wanted him at home. I'd like to see him again, huh? Yeah. <clears throat> T 
hard. And, and I was there through the uh, end of the trial. We had the subsequent proceedings. There were 12. We began to, to uh, prosecute the lesser lights and uh, the generals and the jurists and the doctors and um, the Einsatz group and the people who uh, the death squads mm -hmm. and who ran the concentration camps. Very gonna, interesting experience. I was going to ask you about that. It went on for four or five years, did it not? Yes. Finally, finally it ended in '49. Uh, but uh, you were I, the I still had the military connection, and the military ran the uh, support operation and the lawyers. You were the chief public information yes. officer for the army. Is that right? Uh, yes. Uh, later, I was the number two PR person in the, in the Pentagon, but for for that. For the, the the public relation and dealing with the press, I was in charge. So you were there all four. Yeah. All four years. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, this was a wonderful opportunity for me to look deeper into that yeah. uh, and to and to look at the different trials. Yeah. And you're right; and the ones you hear about are the are the ones or as you said, the big wigs. Yeah. And then the lesser ones. And I think somebody yeah. said the movie was it Judgment at Nuremberg was based more on the jurist. Yes. That's right. Because what you had was judges who were having to follow the laws that yeah, had been that, made, and yet right. uh, they knew often yeah. that, that some, they were. Some people really didn't think it was fair. So there's the victor uh, punishing the vanquished mm -hmm. here, here, but uh, there's precedent for it. And the things they did were so horrible that, 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 that somebody had did, to pay. Did we have any idea that those things were going on mm. until what? I think our people, our people knew, but uh, some of the uh, some of the Jewish organizations were critical of the U.S. government for not bombing some of the uh, camps. But th most of them were too deep inside German territory. Our planes maybe couldn't have been going in and come out, and you would have killed them more people yeah. on the ground and you would liberate it. So uh, that, that wasn't feasible to try to, but uh, <coughs> the governments must have known what was going on because we had intelligence. So That didn't start until 46 or 47? Yeah. yeah. Well, you were out of the service by then, right? Uh, no. I came home after that. Okay. Okay. I had you working to, to at the Milwaukee Journal yeah, with yeah, the AP uh, folks. So. Uh, uh, I was out. I was actually out of the army for for a period of time, and I got recalled to duty <coughs> um, about the, uh, the time of the the, the, the uh, Japanese occupation. They were sending people over, so that was my interlude. With I had met, I had a sister who lived in Milwaukee, and uh, <coughs> I went up to visit her and got to know the managing editor. Of the Milwaukee Journal, one of the great newspapers in the country, and uh, he asked me to write something for him, so I did, and I sold him several pieces to earn a little money and to keep my hand in. Marvin Krieger was his name. <coughs> I spent one summer working on the <coughs> Atlanta Journal as a student. That was a big experience in my life too. Let's go back. I want to make sure. Is there anything else we want to talk about about uh, being on campus? I sort of got us off track when I started talking about Nuremberg. I find it so interesting. Uh, yeah. So we may come back to that again. But um, you finished in '39. Is 39. that right? <clears throat> uh, did we know at the time that that we were probably going to end up in a war? Oh yeah, <clears throat> we all <clears throat> we all knew. Some of us were anxious to. Get involved. And you were heading out to Canada, maybe yeah. to. Well, you took off then. Tell us about your time in the Pacific Northwest a little bit. I, I, I understand you worked as a lumberjack some. Is that right? I had <coughs> picked up a list of university graduates who were living in the West Coast, and I stopped off to see them as I went along. And <coughs> in Longview, Washington, where I uh, was briefly. Did some work for Long Bell Lumber Company. They had a little magazine they were organizing. They called it the Log of Long Bell. And uh, this was 1940. 
and the mobilization had just begun. So I went from there into the Army, and that takes us through the next few years. So, and then uh, you were with the third? And one, one university graduate who was in this San Francisco area <coughs> had studied uh, <coughs> veterinary medicine, John K. Perry from St. Mary's, Georgia. And he took me in, and uh, he had this dog and cat hospital. He was very, very hospitable. Seemed glad to see me, and I was so sure glad to see him. I was freeloading with all of them. So Georgia hospitality uh, is always impressive. So you entered the service while you were on the West Coast? Yes. Volunteered. And then they took send me in, Coach. Right. I'm ready. I'd, <clears throat> I'd had only one, one six weeks tour before that with the Sixth Cavalry at uh, Fort Oglethorpe. <clears throat> Would you? Did you enter as a second lieutenant then? Yes. Okay. And you ended up with the Third Infantry Division. Yes. Right? My first leave orders <clears throat> were signed by a gentleman named Dwight D. Eisenhower, Lieutenant Colonel. He did better than I did for right. <laughs> yeah. He ended up with five stars later. Uh, talk a little bit about your time. Uh, I know you were in North Africa and Italy. Talk a little bit about that. And then let's talk about the PR <coughs> work that you did and why you were in the service the during the war. The 3rd Infantry Division trained uh, on the West Coast from Fort Lewis and went down to Fort Ord in California. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, the authorities changed their strategy. They decided we would not go to the Far East. The Japanese, we'd have to fight them later. So they're going to shift us to Europe. So we started this amphibious training. And our mechanized cavalry <coughs> platoon uh, troop, rather, <coughs> trained in rubber boats. We'd land at night in Monterey Bay and work our way inland. And the Monterey Bay is a natural harbor, and it very much resembles the man-made harbor at Fadala, French Morocco. So our unit was to land in boats, small boats, in Morocco on November the 8th, 1942, <coughs> and take out uh, uh, a fixed gun called Battery Blondin. They had uh, six-inch guns. And uh, this would enable the troops to land without being shot up. <coughs> and the Navy was to fire uh, a salvo over the beach and to try to discourage the French from shooting us. In order to identify ourselves, we all wore an armband of the U.S. flag. I still have one, probably the only one left. Uh, but the French didn't like it. They uh, they did shoot at us, but it only only lasted a couple of days. But the Navy, because of the smoke and the fire and the confusion, they could not see our signal. We had a, a little weapon called a very pistol, and we'd fire a green, a little green rocket. And when they saw the green flares, they were to lift their fire. They didn't do that, so it was friendly fire was our first mm. kill on the beach. Uh, we had a chaplain uh, killed on the beach, too. He was trying to uh, uh, help somebody who'd been, a soldier who'd been wounded and a shell fragment crapped and killed him. And after three days, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we captured Casablanca and um, Patton had come into town, but uh, and with my platoon, uh, we led the first patrol into Casablanca. It got to be a habit. We, we always operated out in front of the division. And we complained bitterly that we were getting shot at by both sides. The enemy is shooting at us, and when, when you fire over our heads, they sometimes fall short. So lift your fire. <coughs> And it moved uh, uh, there, then all the way through Sicily and Italy, yes. right? Another, another boy from Georgia was in the troop at, uh, at Fidella. After things settled down, uh, I bumped into uh, an engineer unit, 
And there was Bill Glimmer from Commerce, Georgia. He'd been a law student. He's later uh, on the Supreme Court of Georgia. And he died a few years ago. So uh, I said, wouldn't you like to be back in the cavalry? He'd, uh, he'd been in the horse troop at, at the university. And he said, sure. So with his patrol and my patrol, we, we were always ahead of the division. And several, the Associated Press uh, wrote up several stories about these Georgia lieutenants who were always uh, in the, the first end of the city, including Palermo in the Sicily. And between, uh, between battles, uh, the G1, the personnel officer of the 3rd Division, drafted me to, to <coughs> write the citations for heroism. And uh, I wrote most of the citations for the Medal of Honor. 3rd Division won, I believe, 39 of the 40 Medals of Honor, most of them posthumous. Uh, and one was from my, a boy in my troop from California named David Weber. Uh, and that was a, a somber job, but one I enjoyed doing very much. <clears throat> we had to talk to members of the unit and find out exactly what had happened on a particular uh, occasion and verify the information so that they could be uh, rewarded for it. Gosh, 39 out of 40. Tough. This, this division is uh, just coming back from their third trip to, to uh, Iraq. In fact, they captured uh, Baghdad in the first one. Mm. And they had one, one soldier, a sergeant, received the Medal of Honor. It cost him his life yeah. in the Baghdad. You may have read about it. Smith was his name. Talk to us a little bit about how your responsibilities changed from the time that you were uh, doing that to going on to the public relations staff of, of I spent, <coughs> during the combat phase of World War II, I just, with my division, I spent 511 days in combat. Not continuously, but cumulatively. Uh, but, uh, most of my years in the military service were just interspersed with going to school. The Army keeps trying to educate us. So, uh, you know, I went to the Calvary School, the Armor School, the Communications School, Command and General Staff College, the War College. Uh, it takes a, a lot of years. All of these uh, help produce a rounded military officer, and I enjoyed them all. And you ended up with, uh, during the war, This was, I, I guess this was toward the end of the war, uh, General Phillips, you ended up on uh, General Eisenhower, yep. Bradley, <clears throat> and Patton's public relations staff, is that right? At, at the very end of the war, I was on General Patton's staff, again dealing with the press because I knew so many of them and had been a newspaper man myself. <clears throat> after, after the fall of Paris, the capture of Paris, I was assigned to General Bradley's headquarters at Verdun. And <clears throat> this was just a big headquarters staff that they called the 12th Army Group. And again, the Third Army needed me uh, with, with their troops, so I was called back down there. And, and the Eisenhower connection came during the North African period. Mm -hmm. It was called AFHQ, Allied Force Headquarters, and at Algiers. <coughs> and the, the, the division sent liaison people to help out with the press coverage and the escort the reporters around the cover. So you, you ended up with that duty a lot. Yes. <coughs> and after in the Battle of Kasserine Pass <coughs> in February of 43, the Germans had mauled us rather badly 
and they had to kill a lot of people and destroyed a lot of material. And they sent General Patton in to straighten out the mess. You've seen that movie. Mm -hmm. uh, I <coughs> they asked for volunteers to go up and replace the casualties. So I went with that group and uh, fought with the 9th Division for the rest of the North African campaign. Went back to my, my division uh, and uh, went in on the Sicilian operation. And as we started out uh, from Italy, I went back to England and went in with Patton on the invasion of France. Tell us that story again about uh, when President Roosevelt was oh. had the president secretly to the, the president and uh, Mr. Churchill uh, agreed to meet and discuss strategy at the Anfa Hotel in Casablanca. Uh, and he came to visit uh, the nearest division headquarters. We, we had troops who landed in Algiers, in Algeria, and <coughs> on the coast of Morocco. So he came to us being closer and uh, to inspect the troops and to meet with General Patton. And again, my platoon drew the job of being the, having the, the honor escort, and we didn't shoot him. <laughs> that was the first good thing. Huh? <laughs> the Secret Service was afraid we might attempt it, but. <clears throat> and you got to, you got to know, I oh. think, General Patton. You said. Yeah. <clears throat> in a personal. Well, well, we had uh, close contact with him. He colorful. He. he uh, his language was sometimes a, a little uh, rough, <coughs> but uh, George Scott, I thought, was magnificent in portraying Patton in the role. But <coughs> he, uh, George Scott's voice is deep and masculine. Patton had a high-pitched voice, and a lot of people attributed his habit of swearing to the fact to cover up his uh, squeaky voice. But <coughs> he, he tried to award people for performance, and he, he, he didn't have any, any time for anybody who was slack in meeting his obligations. And I'm sure he deeply regretted slapping the soldier, but he was upset. And, uh, he had yeah. a colorful, certainly had a colorful. Uh, yeah. yeah. History, I guess you could yeah. say. So, but you, but you found him to be a person who. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. we could do. Respected a hard, somebody yeah. who was doing a, uh, working hard. Yeah. Um, he got along very well with the the Sultan, they call it, the Sultan. Once you call him, they could chat in in, in French, uh, and the Arab king, uh, of course, was fluent in French, but he had an official interpreter who uh, translated into Arabic and back and forth. And Patton chatted with him in, uh, in French, of course. Pretty good French. He had studied at the Sorbonne mm -hmm. and at the military school. And you were fluent in French, so you knew what was going on. Yeah. Talk a little bit about uh, anything else we need to say about your wartime experience well, before. I must uh, mention the Casa Blanca before we leave. At the, uh, at the embassy there, and, and it was actually in Rabat, the uh, Italian embassy, they had this huge German shepherd. And uh, I liked the dog, and he followed me home. <laughs> and <coughs> we had him for several years. And I have a wire photo which is showing me and the dog in a, in a, in a trench. And we, we called him, uh, we called him Il Duce. Uh, the, which is Italian for leader. <laughs> Mr. Mussolini's name is yes. well. Yes, that's what. So the dog just took up with you, huh? Yeah. He was hungry, I guess. <laughs> I, dogs, dogs like me. <laughs> uh, you came back after the war, but mm -hmm. you were still in the service, or you were out no. briefly? Still in the service well, after? I had one more school after that. And then, and, and then at that point, 
it would have been close to Nuremberg. You were called in or called back to, yes. to work that. Yes. What were you? What was your ta responsibilities related to Nuremberg? Take care of the press. Be sure they had access to the lawyers and the documents. The documents fill this room for every trial. Incidentally, uh, I arranged for <clears throat> a complete set of the documents to repose in the library. And right. I think they're in our law library. Are they in our yes, law? Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. One of the, what, just a few uh, yes, institutions were, that have those. Three, uh, four, four depositories. <clears throat> One in Washington, uh, Harvard, uh, University of Arkansas, and University of Georgia. When we see the way that some of the military tribunals are being discussed today uh, with the things that are going on, I, I take it that the uh, British, the Russians, the um, English, um, the French, and the United States decided how to try. Yes. Is the, is yes. the, the four of the four countries decided yes. how to yes. try, and it was basically a military tribunal, was it not? Uh, or yeah. run by the military. Yeah, it was a military tribunal. judges. An right? international military tribunal. Uh, the, the Russians sat on it too, on the big right. the big trial. I looked at the at the defendants. Uh, uh, this is a wonderful opportunity. I'm a history major. Wonderful yeah. oh. opportunity for me to, to delve into that. Were you actually in the courtroom while oh, yeah. that was going? Frequently. What was your we, three or four reactions to just the things you saw, oh, the yeah. people you <clears throat> saw? One wondered how, how these people could abrogate their, their responsibilities to humanity to, to, to do some of the things for which they're responsible. But the Germans claimed, and uh, the, the ministries, the uh, State Department of people who were representing the German government, they said, we just did our duty. We, we, were, following, we were following orders, mm -hmm. which is, is no excuse, and that's why we hang some of them. Right. We, right. <coughs> Gehring committed suicide? Yeah. Yes, Gehring did. Um, I guess they, Hitler they, and, and who? Hitler and... Hitler was a suicide. I, there were two or three others. That yeah, was, yeah. Him, was Himmler tried or was he also a... Uh, well, Himmler went into the British headquarters to turn himself in, but the clerk he talked with didn't understand German, so he took his pill, mm -hmm. the cyanide, and killed himself. Uh, and uh, later, uh, Rommel was forced to commit suicide mm -hmm. because Hitler was after him for being part, part of the, the conspiracy. Part of the plot. And he promised him if he'd give him a nice funeral and take care of his family if he'd just quietly <laughs> disappear. Interesting. Uh, well, I, sometime when you've got a day off, and I've got a day off, I would love to talk to you so about some of the- delighted to. It was just uh, so interesting. and and. But also conducted, I thought, in a way that everybody felt like was yes. because of certainly some of those people were exonerated, mm -hmm. uh, or, or, or at least did not have to serve any time. A That's couple right. of those people, am That's I right? Um, you also worked, and were you in the military during the Marshall Plan? Uh, the point at which you were doing public information for uh, the Marshall Plan. Yes, yeah. yeah. <coughs> I was. Uh, in the embassy in Paris as an, as an attaché. And uh, <coughs> a lot of the military people were involved in <coughs> different administration of the program. And, and I was one of those uh, who was drafted primarily because of my newspaper background. And what, what just making people aware of what the Marshall Plan was and uh, what was yes. going on? Yes. Uh, uh, They sent me around to the different uh, countries participating in the plan to assist with the promoting the publicity. The story didn't always get out of the source of this aid, and uh, <coughs> we wanted to get credit for it, in other words, and be sure that it was properly right. distributed. Everybody understood. It was a good program. <coughs> they had what was called the counterpart fund, the local government uh, put up in their local currency to matching the money that we had mm -hmm. paid for the stuff we were sending them. Pretty good arrangement. Matching, yes. sort of matching grants, yes. huh? 
And you in Burma also? Uh, I was the attaché in the embassy there when we were watching on developments in uh, Saigon. I thought at the time that we should have helped the French at the time of the Dien Bien Phu. Uh, but our president uh, at the time didn't didn't like the French and thought uh, the colonialism had had its day, so had we stepped in, we might have postponed some of the later difficulties. Yeah. And we reported back on the developments. <coughs> but I would have preferred to have been in Saigon where you had the French influence. Uh, they learned to cook, and uh, <laughs> you had, uh, and, and the, the Burmese learned from the British. <laughs> So we'd have the good food in Saigon, yeah. huh? When yeah. now did you leave the service? My, I actually retired uh, all connection in 77. Okay, but bef but you worked for Delta Airlines. Yeah, that was during the period I was in the reserve between, yes, yeah. between. Did you go I had total, total service of 34 years. And, active and reserve. You left uh, after the your work with the Marshall Plan, then was that when you went to work for Delta? Yes. And you worked for Delta for about seven years was my No, it was about five years. And what, what did you do there? You worked on their public relations staff? Yeah, PR. Was Delta ready when you were? Was that your? Yeah, in those days it was. It's a different story. Uh, isn't it? I was a speechwriter for the president, and I'd done a lot of speech writing for the army. So you were back in closer yeah. to home, back in Atlanta. Yeah. And then I, I understand you went to work in 1960. You uh, were the director of the Aerospace Corporation office in Washington D.C. Is that right? Yes. Tell us who who uh, was Aerospace. Aerospace was the architect, engineering firm that handled a lot of classified Air Force projects. The Air Force didn't have the engineering staff to to prepare, and uh, <coughs> we we dealt with the Congress and uh, with the press to be sure that the space program was covered, and aerospace is part of it was accurately described. Okay. And then you had your own public relations firm. Yes. Two different firms, is that right? Well, uh, <coughs> as I mentioned, Ewell Phillip, Ken, Ken Ewell had been the number one PR person in General Motors. And his boss retired, who was one year too old to succeed as the president of the corporation. And he had nothing to do for about a year or so, we teamed up to represent some clients in uh, Washington. And Earl Koch was a university class of 42. Uh, he and I were friends from college days. He was the first uh, World War II veteran to head the American Legion and had a lot of political connections. So uh, we were in business until he, his death. And that, you, you started together in 65, is that right? Yeah. And y'all were still, you were in Washington. Yeah. Well, then I saw that you came home to Royston and you were the city manager. First one. First one. Uh, <coughs> the city, uh, which is about a three and a half million dollar operation every year, they had always done business of our committee. Uh, members of the city council, in addition to making a living, had to, uh, had some civic responsibility. The system was not working too well. So they uh, <coughs> asked if, if I wouldn't help them get organized. And I said, I'll give you one year, no more than two years. So we went in, <coughs> and before that time, we, we'd rolling over the, the note at the bank every year. And that first year, we ended up with $33,000 in the bank. So from that time on, Things have improved. I stayed there almost two years and, and hired a university graduate, Frank Ginn, who's now manager of Franklin County. He succeeded me. Had lunch with him today at Rotary. <coughs> that accounts for that.
So got, got, that's, that's got my it only mu my only municipal experience. <laughs> that was enough, I'm guessing. Yeah. Have I left out any of your professional career that we need to talk about? What a an amazing life, General Phillips. You you a diversity and uh, of uh, yeah. task and responsibilities and. Oh, you get I've done a lot of traveling at the taxpayers' expense. A lot too. of traveling around the world. I was able at. Uh, before we severed connections with the government, I was able to uh, take my wife and visit some of the battlefields that, that uh, we had fought mm -hmm. on, uh, and that was uh, an interesting experience. Well, it, uh, yeah. certainly. Oh, okay. Incidentally, I, I organized the first uh, 50th anniversary of the, of the journalism class in Georgia, 19. <coughs> In '89, uh, six of us showed up, and since that time, three uh, have passed You've away. Lost three of those. So Claude Davidson was one of those who, who attended, and Bill Forehan, who ended up being a judge, uh, and uh, Regina Rapier from Social Circles, she's passed away. She was there. So Charlie Thorpe and uh, and I are the last two remaining. And Tom Russell was uh, the host, and he said he was going to con continue this. I don't know whether they have or not. It's a nice idea, don't you think? Mm -hmm. General Phillips, talk to us about, uh, uh, you, you've said that you covered the visit of FDR yes. to the university. Can you tell us a little bit about that? For a summer graduation, it, it, it was a sellout. I've never seen so many people. And he, he was very, very gracious and managed to get up on the platform. It was very difficult for him to, to, to walk with his braces. And, and I, was, I was impressed with it. And I, I think that that class was really thrilled to have the president graduating with them <laughs> or vice versa. I would have been thrilled. <clears throat> the, uh, it must have been a typo or something. The, the journal gave me two bylines on that story. I, I turned it into the dean. I said, told him I should get extra credit for that. <laughs> what did he? Uh, just a traditional graduation speech. Did he? Did he ride into the stadium in a in a uh, car? In, in his open Cadillac sedan. Yes, they and were very close to the podium and then went up the ramp. His son traveled with him a lot, yes. and he helped him yes. walk. I saw in a film last night. I don't right. know if you've been watching Miss Miss yeah. Vanderbilt Mission yeah. today. PBS down at, uh, down at Warm Springs, he even drove a drove a car. Yeah. And they had a special <laughs> ship. Mm -hmm. He was in <clears throat> Warm Springs. No, I mean <clears throat> general. Where, Where were you when the president died? Do you remember in April of '45? Uh, Paris, I guess, or on the way back. One of those things that, like President Kennedy's death and yeah. and some some of the other things that have happened that yeah. everybody right. sort of remembers. Um, talk about you've had such an interesting life. What who were some of the most interesting characters you've ever met? I have so many. Tell us about, tell them, tell them, tell it all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, certainly, certainly Patton and Eisenhower and Bradley and all the other generals, uh, including Truscott, the third division, uh, all of those, uh, uh, Even de Gaulle at the liberation of Paris. What was your reaction to him? Uh, the, the French called him L'Asperge, asparagus. He's just he's so tall. But I rather admired him. <clears throat> uh, there were crowds of troops and Frenchmen all over the place, and he was walking towards us. Uh, 
Notre Dame Cathedral, and there were still some people around shooting, and you could hear the, the gunfire, and uh, he didn't budge. He went well, right ahead. Uh, most people would have ducked a little bit and taken the side street, but he strode into the cathedral. I said, well, he's a cool one. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Did I read that you received the quarter gear? Yes. Tell us about that. The Legion of Merit and the quarter gear? Tell us. Uh, that, that was for, <coughs> for, for being in, I was there <laughs> for the, <coughs> I had a jeep and a driver, and we got into Paris the night before the city fell, and there was street fighting the next day around. And uh, we set up a, a machine gun at the Arch of Triumph, <coughs> and uh, there were some French colonial soldiers there. They had the machine gun. We had one on our jeep, and uh, across the, uh, the square, uh, the circle, there were people upstairs shooting. <clears throat> and some of their rounds struck the uh, the base of the arch, and they're still there, those nicks. I took Louis de Rose there to show him one time. So uh, I, was, uh, I was there just, uh, and uh, later <clears throat> my, the third division liberated the last little chunk of soil held by the Germans. So the, the division received uh, the entire unit quite a year, but I already had mine, so I didn't. I didn't need another one. <coughs> They're very generous. They were. Um, you've mentioned then uh, famous generals. Um, who in your did you meet ever meet George Marshall? Yes. Tell us about him, the Marshall Plan, the Secretary of State. He a great man. As Churchill paid him a, a tremendous tribute. He says, uh, you gave us victory. He credited General Marshall because he was the grand strategist. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but he came uh, at the time I had the opportunity to be close to him. Uh, was when he came to visit the 3rd Division, which, in which he had served, and he went around and shook hands with the, the staff. Uh, very, very impressive man. Very Good impressive. Military man. Did, were, did oh, you did, ever work with him when you were working on the Marshall Plan, or? Oh, uh, no, he, <coughs> he was credited, he was given his, his name, but uh, he, he was not involved in the administration of it. In the running of it. Yeah. Huh? Uh, gentlemen, uh, y'all have any other? Let me see. I wanted to want. Mm. Oh, I met President Kennedy, of course, and Lyndon Johnson, <coughs> Dick Russell, all those great men. They were great men. Tell us how uh, you well, came in contact with President Kennedy. Oh, uh, Jacqueline, Mrs. Kennedy was having some kind of a, an affair for one of her, the units she was interested in helping, and I was invited to, uh, to the party. And Kennedy, uh, Kennedy came and says, I've always wanted to make a speech at a cocktail party. <laughs> and he, he told us, he, he gave us credit for being the most distinguished group ever to assemble in the dining room there since Mr. Jefferson dying <laughs> alone, that's, that's the time. So great line. Yeah, great line. He, he was very outgoing. Certainly charismatic. How about, uh, and, and then President Johnson, of course, had sort of a different yeah. approach to things. I wrote, uh, for, I did some writing for the White House when I was in the Pentagon. Uh, off and on over the years, I was ended up in the public relations office. and. <coughs> Uh, Lyndon Johnson ordered that his people who sent him personal Christmas cards should be acknowledged. So uh, among those we sent out, the president has asked me to thank you for your beautiful Christmas. <laughs> 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 I thought it was a nice touch. Uh, That's vanity for you, isn't it? <laughs> How many languages do you do? I'm a little rusty on it. I can I can read and understand German everything except uh, <coughs> uh, the Bavarian accent. <coughs>
uh, French and Italian I can manage and I can read Spanish. But uh, my grandchildren have studied Spanish. It's probably more useful yeah. in dealing with our hired help. Yeah, and you're right. We all need to speak I notice Spanish. nearly every product you meet, uh, you buy at the grocery store has a uh, bilingual. Right. I don't see any in French except the poupon. <laughs> <laughs> the the gray poupon. <laughs> uh, Do you gentlemen? Have any thoughts? Louis de Roche was a close friend of Pierre Poupon, who originated oh, right? the formula. And I spoke in speaking with uh, Christiane de Roche, Louis's widow. She said she used to see Poup Pierre Poupon's sister regularly. They went to the spas together. But, uh, <clears throat> and he did not import that wonderful mustard until after World War II. I urged Louis, tell Pierre to, to it's too good to keep to yourself. Share it with the U.S. Well, and it has and I believe uh, uh, the Heinz Empire owns it now. Didn't they buy it? I believe so. That's, that sounds like that sounds right. General Phillips, I have a question for you. Yes, sir. You, you met all these Allied generals and commanders. Yes. Did you ever meet uh, Georgi Zhukov from Russia or any of the Russian commanders? Oh. Uh, and if so, do you have what, what memories do, might you have I, of that? I met the uh, the uh, the general who served on the tribunal at uh, uh, at Nuremberg. I got a Timoshenko. Uh, I'm trying to think of this beautiful Russian woman who was his interpreter. I'd, I'd, I'd have to <laughs> have to look her up. Any any uh, colorful stories, perhaps after the war, when all these armies got together, maybe how the soldiers behaved with one another, maybe the British with the French or with the Russians or anything. <coughs> we, uh, my old division, as a society, the Society of the Third Infantry Division, we meet every year, one, one reunion. It's, it's my age, it was organized after the first war. And uh, the division is known because of its uh, World War I record, repulsed three German counterattacks at Verdun. Uh, so we, we meet and commemorate uh, our fallen friend and hero. And, I always mention uh, those we lost in the division. We had uh, 11,200 casualties in mm. the division. We're getting in <coughs> reports of 400 a week. Uh, in, in World War II, our strategy was not to relieve units, but to keep feeding in fresh troops uh, is a replacement. So you figured, well, sooner or later, uh, they're going to manage to to kill me too. So we we, we were kind of fatalistic about it. The, the, the Germans used to pull their units out to Bring in come, come in and relieve. Fresh but but we, we we used a replacement system, and uh, everybody's pushing forward. But mm -hmm. it. We had uh, a second lieutenant just out of training school and come in at dusk and go up and join their unit. And next night they'd bring some of them back in the ba on in the backs bag. of donkeys in, in Italy and they didn't, didn't last overnight. Hmm. Well, this has been most interesting for us. Well, it's been a pleasure. For me to we recall some of these things. Appreciate your sharing with us. We we just uh, I think when we got started on this project, say uh, uh, 18 months ago or something mm -hmm. like that, and we began to look at, at what an interesting pool of yeah. of uh, graduates yeah. and, and alum alumni alumni it's we been had. A, <coughs> it's been a good life, and I'm uh, grateful to have lived so long.
Well, uh, you know, as Louise McBee said, it ain't over yeah. yet. So two you, year, got, you got some time to go here. Two years ago, uh, the mayor of Franklin Springs organized a dinner for all veterans from this area. Uh -huh. Invited everybody in. City picked up the tab. They asked me to speak. And I told them, uh, that I, I stand before you uh, uh, not as a hero, but as a survivor. And that's, that's all I can claim.